So welcome to uh, another session on the living memory of cities. Uh, the usual notice before we start, uh, this is an informal gathering. Our session is being recorded and it will only be broadcast later. So if you do not wish to be recorded, please uh, just uh, switch off your camera uh, or microphone. Uh, as many of, where, uh, of you are aware, there's also another series we've been doing in collaboration with Father Peter Newby from St. Mary's University, and that's a series on sacred space. Uh, the next talk as part of that series will be next week on the 15th uh, of November. Uh, that will be will, uh, with uh, Neil McLaughlin, and Neil's talk is entitled Old Timbers to New Fires, which is a, a quote from T.S. Eliot. Uh, we're hoping to gather a small group uh, in the office, but for those of us uh, joining online, uh, we should send the link by email tomorrow <coughs> as usual. Today we have with us uh, architect uh, Tony Fretton, uh, whose presentation is entitled and Nature Begins to Relate to Us Only When We Indwell in It, When Culture Begins in It. And that's a quote from uh, Romano Guardini. Uh, as always, the proceedings will be very simple. Eric will be chairing the session, uh, Tony will be doing his uh, keynote presentation, and this will then be followed by the usual period uh, for questions. Finally, a note to thank uh, Duncan MacDonald, who has been assisting with these sessions at Eric Parry Architects, and our graphics team in particular, uh, Russell Watson and Roma McCook, who have been updating our website and events uh, program. And a word to also for uh, Winnie Dellison. And uh, I would like to give the floor to Matthew for his uh, welcome and notices on behalf of London Met. Over to you, Matthew. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Jose. And uh, I just was, I have a couple of words on behalf of us at London Met. I just wanted to say briefly welcome tonight to everyone to the event and how delighted I am and, and we are at London Met that Tony Fretton is speaker tonight. Uh, Tony is a much loved and admired um, and sometimes feared member of the academic family at our School of Architecture at London Met, where he's been teaching for much longer than I have. Uh, everyone knows Tony's practice very well um, and that it is highly regarded and carries with it the implication of both distinction and prowess. His considerable portfolio includes many significant uh, buildings. Everyone will know the Listen Gallery, uh, the Red House in Chelsea that every architect of my generation wants to emulate, um, the British Embassy in Warsaw and many other important projects. Close to home, Tony's been working recently alongside our Student Society Mass and in dialogue with our friends at the Architecture Foundation to deliver a series of lectures by our studio teachers about architects uh, that they think are inspiring. And this initiative of the students with Tony's support um, guides and reinforces the conceptualization of the studio as not only the place of creativity and productivity, but also a context for thinking and uh, thinking and talking and arguing, sometimes for drinking and for everything and anything. This is an important reminder, especially in the aftermath of the most severe period of the pandemic, that the life of the architect is very much in the studio. Uh, mm -hmm. And in this regard, it's very exciting. Um, and I feel proud on behalf of London Met to offer these words of introduction uh, for Tony. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you now over to Eric uh, to chair the session. Thanks, Phil. I think that covers uh, brilliantly um, the introduction, just to say that Tony is a massively respected teacher and practitioner and somebody um, who I have uh, I've always admired greatly. So let's uh, over to Tony and then we'll pick up <coughs> questions at the end of your presentation. Thank you so much. Oh, great. OK, well, the subject of these seminars has been the drama of intervening in the historical fabric of cities, which is seen as the fabric of living memory. And as a person formed by living in a city, the city of London, it would have been straightforward for me to talk along these lines, but I've chosen to talk as a city person about realizing buildings in rural locations. I'll talk about the design intuitions between behind three rural projects and what I hope they achieved. But there's a central proposition in, in the buildings of my practice, which is that they 
should satisfy those encounter them at a simple level of pleasure and utility, but also at the same time make a contribution to the culture of seeing and experience. So having designed in nature intuitively as a city person, I draw some post hoc support from this statement by Romano Giardini in his letters from Lake Como, where he says, we have never had any relation to nature in untouched form. The longing for untouched nature is itself a product of culture originating in the over artificiality of existence. In truth, nature begins to relate to us only when we indwell in it, when culture begins in it. Culture then develops and bit by bit, nature is refashioned. So these three rural buildings consist of one, which was a project and two that were realized. And I, of course, can't change my screen. Yeah, here we go. Um, the first is, um, the first was a project in Holy Isle. The arrow that you can probably see here uh, indicates the island, which is very small. It's an island off the Isle of Arran, which again is off the body of um, Scotland. And <clears throat> you can see the red dot next to Lockerbie. That's the Samya Ling's Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist community. And the island was intended as a place of retreat. This building that we're looking at is in Scotland and it was built by volunteers. And it's extraordinary. I have been here and I have attended a service in this space, which is overwhelmingly uh, different from anything else you can imagine. Um, and the island of the isle itself is like this. It's remote, only reached by boat. And you see it again in, in relation to the Isle of Arran. <clears throat> so in our competition entry, we put at the top end left, we put a visitor center. And then remotely at the bottom, we put two retreat centers. And in this form of Buddhism, the retreats are very long. They're um, uh, two years and men and women are segregated. So this model gives an indication of the scale and we were concerned, I was concerned that how these buildings would be seen from the sea and what they would look like, what their coloration would be. But also the question was how they would be built. And we figured that, that they could be built by um, bringing materials by landing craft to the edge of the beach <clears throat> and then have them be lifted up manually, walked up the hill. And the two buildings could be um, constructed by removing the earth and building directly off the rock. So the outcome of that would be that the building, although its plan had rationale, um, the shape of the building would vary according to the uh, site that it found itself on. In this plan, we see um, in the middle drawing, we see the cells, the retreat cells with a garden in the middle and a ward garden around the outside. And then on the left is, is a, a temple, a religious space and a space also for um, uh, yoga and other forms of exercise and a refectory. So it would have been very, very large. It would have had a certain level of community spirit. And it would have, um, it was a building that was designed to accept errors, uh, decisions made by local builders, um, aesthetic decisions made by them. So the hope was that it would, it would be, um, it would have a particular kind of character, a non-architectural character. And these sketches by me indicate how it might have been 
to be in that building. In the bottom right, there's some um, the um, yoga room and refectory, and then you can begin to see on the left the central courtyard, and above it another view of the central courtyard. And there was also the land outside the retreat centre where people could go. So in consequence, um, what I feel now I'd like to say is that that with these very practical means, you would get some kind of um, representational quality. You would get a, a building that was made by lots of people, evidently made by lots of people, rather different from the temple in the mainland, rather more pragmatic. Um, but the, the overarching theme here is that these buildings would be in some ways, one one for women, and one for men. That these buildings would be like plants. You know, they would be plants of the same species, which were shaped by the land in which they grew. So ultimately, there would be an organic quality to it. Faith House, which is in Dorset, is in a a group of buildings which. Um, were donated by um, donated by a philanthropist to a religious community, a, a fundamentally, well, not fundamental, but a, a basically Christian, has in its program people with disabilities, and um, so it had. It used lots of the buildings on the estate for um, counselling, for accommodation. And to the right of this building, you can't see it, but there's a, a hotel designed by somebody else, which was um, a place of respite. Um, if you're a carer for um, somebody with a disability, it's it's very it's exhausting. And so the carer's hotel was where you could take your the person you were caring for and leave them in care of other people and have a holiday. But this building, this building we see here, had a different intention. It was principally, it had to have a religious content, but no purpose. And then it was to acquire purpose. And I asked the organisers at Faith House, or Holton Lee, I should say, which is where it's located. What's their, what was their, what belief system, what beliefs should it exhibit? And they said it should simply talk about the relationships between people and nature. And this is the only building in the whole of my career that I've ever been asked to situate. And I chose this slight uh, raised ground next to um, uh, of an existing farmhouse. And the model indicates some of the way that it's arranged. Um, there's a small room here. Can, can you see my cursor? Complete silence. OK. Um, we can't see it. Can, can you see uh, the cursor that I'm pointing? No. No. All right, then I'll have to do it another way. Um, so there's Looking at this model, on the left, there's an entrance porch. And then beyond it, there's a small room with a circle of trees in it, which is a place for quiet contemplation, which is open um, 24 hours a day. And then to the right is a room for art exhibitions, meetings, counselling, and things like that. And this is how it sits in relation to the existing buildings. At the bottom of the page is the um, a respite hotel, and then above it is um, the um, cottage. And to the left is a an archive centre that we designed but hasn't been built. So here's the plan, and it's positioned and designed to be approached from a distance. So this drawing shows that that actually to get it to Holton Lee, the estate, you drive along a very, very long 
road, straight road, and you find Faith House, which is at the bottom of this picture. And this is how you approach it. So you discover this building by walking and driving. And you see it surrounded by sky and you see the sky penetrating the building. And this is the room with trees in it. Um, for me, it was very interesting to make a building uh, which was for faith, but no defined faith that it could have been for people with um, non-Christian um, belief systems. So you make a, a symbol, you make a symbol which you hope is open to interpretation by other people. And you can sit in the middle of this tree scape and look at the landscape and feel enclosed. Um, and you do this without cynicism or irony. It's That's the most pleasing part about this project, that you have to service beliefs of other people that you can't comprehend as richly as you possibly can. But if you come into the porch, you, you look back, you look back to where you've been, which is has some significance, you know, that, that you've journeyed for a long time, come to the small building, and then you look back and think about how you approached it. And the big room, which is on the top right of the plan, is, is a very simple room, and its intention is that you would experience other life forms, which the, the field outside does have um, livestock in it sometimes, has butterflies and things like that. So it's it's to let human beings see that they're not the only ones in the world. And that room has a, a door that opens to the garden of the respite hotel and a porch. And this allows it to um, be used in a different way, to be used for social events and things like that. So the aim here was to produce a building some definition in its form, which turned out to be open to interpretation. And one of the psychotherapists, when I opened, this building opened, said, um, I want to say something about the building. You probably won't like it. And she said, what I feel about this building is that it's a blank canvas onto which I can project anything I want. And I said, that's exactly what I hope would happen. The last project is the Fulsang Art Museum in, in Denmark, which is two and a half hours outside, um, uh, two, two and a half hours south of um, Copenhagen. And again, you travel a long way through flat countryside to reach this. So the experience of arrival is very important. You come into, you leave your car in a car park and you come into an existing courtyard. On the right is a white barn, which is um, very beautiful. And then ahead, a manor house with three elements in the facade and a pond. Um, Thanks. So it's... Uh, yeah. I'm sorry? Okay. And the interior of this building is, is also special. It's been it's been altered over the years. It, it's the ceilings in each room are different. The floors change from room to room. And in the building we made, we allowed that to influence the decor of the ceiling and floor. And we made floors which are not like this, but actually they have their own design integrity, but they change from room to room. So the idea is that when you're in an art space, the background changes very slightly. So it's a stimulus. The building doesn't call attention to itself, but it stimulates your view. And it's the purpose of the building is for you to, to be able to just look at the art. So the manor house is on the left-hand side and the building that we made is on the right-hand side. The brief for the project suggested very strongly that the new museum building 
the new art museum should enclose the courtyard. And we chose a different strategy, which was to keep that courtyard open. And I'll show you why with the photograph in a second. But the outcome of that is that it puts the um, museum out in the fields with more informal buildings. So it, it has a relationship with the manor house, but a very offset one. The question here, in a way, was what? Uh, how do you make a a very large building of, of a different type that never been experienced in a place like this, and and join it together with the existing fabric? The reason for keeping that side open is that as you arrive, you see this land, and the land goes it's very very flat, and it goes to the sea through a, a nature reserve. So it's very beautiful and all these fields have been made by centuries of effort, um, which is something I'll come back to. So this is how you approach it and you arrive at it and it's white like the white barn. It has alignments with the surroundings. Um, and when you're inside it in the cafe, you look out through a, a room for um, painting classes to an apple orchard. And this is a theme that occurs throughout the building. You, as, as you arrive, you see the landscape, then the landscape is taken away, and then it's given back as a series of views. Since my cursor isn't working, I can't really explain the plan, but, but this room that we're looking at is on the left hand side would be room seven. And the galleries are arranged around a central gallery, which on the plan is, is 12. And so the a 13 is a, a temporary exhibition space and 14 is a permanent collection space. So the, the collection is known. It, it's um, Danish art in all of the European styles from um, 1700 to 1970. So it's a rather interesting collection. And at the end of the the um, the end of this room, you see um, a window, which we'll get to in a little while. And on the other side of it is the temporary exhibition space, which has a gridded ceiling with roof lights above it. Again, this is 13 on the plan. And the roof lights can be darkened or, or open. So you can have, at one end of the building, you could have a film show, and the other end, you could have full daylight. And then 14 are the rooms for um, uh, late 19th century art with a different form of roof light. Then across from the corridor is room 11. And these are smaller rooms for um, paintings with, um, well, from the Danish golden age and the ceiling changes. The figure that you see in the ceiling is um, a light shaft that you might have noticed on the exterior, these three large uh, conic, uh, rotated forms are, are in fact um, light shafts and they light the floor not the wall so that you can keep the levels on the wall um, to 50 degrees and these 50 lights and these rooms are linked on filade and they finish in a room for plaster casts which because they they have no conservation issues they can have a window and you leave that room and then you find this room and this room was devised by the client. Um, it's a room where they never show art, but it's a room where in the midpoint of the exhibition, you can see the landscape. And my hope is that to some people, the fields out here will be seen as just a significant, a cultural artifact made by uh, anonymous people as the paintings in the exhibition, which are made by individuals. And that's that room from the outside. 
the room inadvertently rhymes with a, a small building on the left. And here it is from a distance. This is the final slide. And I, I want to say that we always think that abstract, or we often think that abstraction was something invented by the modern movement. But in fact, there's another form of abstraction which comes in vernacular buildings, like the white barn that we see to the left, which is which comes through building and rebuilding, uh, constant modification, constant reduction, refinement, and uh, minimalization. That is the end of my lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. So, um, who would like to open the the dialogue with Tony? Um, yeah. Well, well, while people gather their thoughts, perhaps I could just ask a question um, about horizon in a rural uh, context and horizon in an urban context and you know though just thinking about your uh, your concentration on the form of the buildings set against horizons uh, in the retreat and then your choice of siting in terms of horizon and, and then of course the museum which echoes incredibly evocatively painting um, and uh, of, of that kind of northern uh, Baltic world of people like Emil Nolder and, and so forth. So interesting just to hear your 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 own uh, interests there, Tony, if you would. I, I hadn't seen it. The horizon as a specific element. I mean, I tend to look at um, everything in a particular well particular I mean I scope things rather than studying them I have a way of looking in the landscape and interpreting it in fact when we when we went to look at the site in the early days of the competition I went with a um, a landscape designer um, a Danish landscape designer called Torben Schonher who's wonderful and he looked at the landscape and I looked at it and I saw it, but Torben looked at it and understood it. And he said that it's a landscape with small groups of trees and water and that we should respect that. And I said, let's bring it right into the courtyard, right up to the edges of all the buildings that existed so that the presence of the land was very, very strong. So it was a more, a, a greater sense of landscaping than the horizon. But I mean, you can't, in, in any situation, there are predominant conditions and the sky and the way it hits the land is, you, you can't avoid that. And just to finish that, um, you know, that that thinking about the intensity of the interior where, where you don't have a landscape, for instance, with a project like the Listen Galleries. Um, how do you, how do you, is there, a, is there a sort of way in which you can intuit, um, you know, one's presence um, within, within the space as, as different between the two conditions? Well, I always saw that the the city around the Listen Gallery very poignantly. I mean, it changes, but <clears throat> it seemed to me <clears throat> to be the sort of epitome of English non-planning. You know, it's disastrous <laughs> that we all made it. And the gallery, in a non-judgmental way, that allows you to look out and say, "We own this. We did this. This is part of English culture." So it's a a view rather than the landscape of um, an accumulation of bad, bad decisions and um, including, unfortunately, a rather unpleasant addition to um, the school opposite it, uh, which was um, 
you have to help me with the name of the original designer. Um, and I've forgotten it, but it was a very, very beautiful scheme. Um, but in a way, you have to accept that um, the city landscape, cityscapes will change, and they will change in ways you didn't want. You know, I used to say blithely that the gallery spaces had some rhyming relationship to the open spaces around them, which to some extent they do. I mean, they, the playground of the school hasn't been covered over yet, but um, all the open sites, they're gone. And it's just packed with some horrible buildings. The, the things that were deeply unpleasant, but in a way um, exciting, have, per have persisted. And the, um, the other aspects have gone away. It's called development. But it's, it seems to work. It seems, and the other thing is that with the Listen Gallery, the facade reflects the trees and the sky. So it, it's not simply a, 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 a viewing space for the surroundings. It, it does do that. And in the embassy, one of the things that I think we achieved is we made the facade of the embassy reflect the sky and the trees around it. So it, it defeated its the possibility that the, the embassy would be uh, a very formal and imposing building. Yeah. Okay. Uh, terrific. Nick, uh, uh, over to you. Thanks, Tony. I really enjoyed your your lecture. I've, I've got I've got a question which I guess starts with the quote that you provided as the introduction to your to your lecture by Romano Guadini, um, which I think is kind of interesting on a number of points. I mean, the I I, I read many years ago. I read the end of of the modern world, which is Guadini's kind of classic work. Um, which was written in the 50s and I think is around contemporary roughly contemporaneous with the um the letters for Lake Como but it may be wrong but he his his work was prophetic of the of the of the, the destruction of the of the modern world he could effectively seen the end of the modern world you know after the second world war seeing its kind of demise into something uh, approaching the the postmodern world and I'm interested in that in the context of Guardini's um, understanding of nature, this kind of plea that we have to indwell in nature and how you, as you describe yourself as a kind of urbanite, uh, exploring this not in the context of the city, but in the context of the rural community and maybe what this tells us about urban life or maybe about the contemporary world in the urban context. And I'm kind of interested in how you you think about this idea of indwelling in nature through the context, through the lens of the view, because one of the things you you kind of repeat in all three examples is the importance of the view. Um, and whether the view is the base upon what upon which we indwell in nature, is it the primary base upon which we encounter nature or we experience nature? Or is there something else going on here? And I think in a way, the choice of your your buildings is kind of indicative of a, a, a difference, I suppose. The, the, the first two is to essentially communal religious buildings. And, and um, the idea that you have to live in nature or you have to live in a community up to kind of two years is in a retreat presupposes that you have to kind of deal with the changing seasons of nature. So time is of the essence to indwell in nature. Maybe that isn't the case when you're visiting a gallery where it becomes kind of momentary, depending upon the, the time of year, depending upon the weather, depending upon you know what you actually encounter within the museum. And I guess I'm just kind of interested in how you see this idea of indwelling um, through architecture that might actually and this goes back to, I guess, the question of the, the theme of this series, the, the living memory of cities. How do we consider nature or the indwelling of nature as the basis of memory? Is architecture 
the synchronicity with nature through time, as David Leatherborough described, I think in Bill and in in, uh, in his in his book on, um, uh, sorry, on I can't remember the name of the book now. Building building time. That's why I was trying to remember the book. He talked about this idea of synchronicity, these momentary overlaps between the rhythms of nature and the rhythms of human life. But that takes time for these overlaps to to bear fruit and to intersect uh, and to be experienced in something meaningful. So he, in a way, he doesn't talk about views. He talks about time. And I'm just going to be interested in how you explore that or how you recognize that in your particular uh, case studies um, or your particular buildings that you've highlighted. Well, I'll say this, uh, I make things, you know, I operate the world of physical culture and its impact on people's lives and I, I'm i not a capable intellectual and I don't want to be, so many of the questions you're raising I can't answer, but Guardini's um, I, I discovered Guardini when I was writing an essay about um, Caesar and Tavera's garden. And, um, and it, when you work in the location, you don't really understand, you don't emote to. It's a, it's a disturbing feeling, you know, are you doing the right thing? And um, I didn't, hadn't, read that quote by Guardini or anything by Guardini when I made any of these buildings. So it's, as I said, it's a post hoc. It gives me some comfort, the wrong word. Let's say um, it makes me feel that I, what I did wasn't a bad thing. You know, it had some effect that it didn't impose a it didn't impose architecture on the space. It made architecture that a uh, place. It it made that I made architecture which <clears throat> look came from looking at the buildings that existed, from which <clears throat> you can deduce a lot. You can deduce a lot about the, the culture of a place that you're working in just by looking at the buildings. And the building we made in central Denmark does just that. And that was a worry. And then the the people who commissioned it looked at it and said, you've let us see our city again. So in a very, very limited way, and, and in, not in an intellectually prepared, propelled way, but simply by uh, looking at uh, the buildings of, that you're making, the buildings that you're putting next to, you can find enough communicable uh, I could find enough knowledge, let's say, or information to make a building that that has a chance of um, people liking, enjoying. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Matthew, please. Uh, yeah. Hi. Thank you. Um, I, I was thinking also in relation to this, um, this overarching theme of memory that we've been looking at. Um, uh, and specifically because we've been looking very clearly at, at, at architecture today and at, at architecture all made by the same hand. Um, these three examples all do uh, communicate and engage with a certain um, ambiguity, and I don't mean ambiguity as in confusion. I mean, they sort of say different things at once. Ambiguity over their claims uh, regarding time, regarding their temporality, they, they, they sort of all have um, a, a presence that in, in different ways is is temple like or has this prismatic um, quality um, and yet also sort of shed like in a way. Um, there's an implication that they are sort of sight making with this uh, found axiality and ali alignment, but then also these moments of informality, sort of quite um, curated informality in each case. Um, and um, I mean, Tony knows this example, but I was just reminded of some of that similar or, or maybe comparable ambiguity. We've been talking a lot in this series about the city as a context where these issues of the way the building is read or communicates to the street uh, is, is very much an urban issue. But here in that relationship with the landscape, I was reminded of uh, the example of Leverenz and Asplund at the Woodland Cemetery, where there's that weird 
temporality, that it's a very modern, also sort of temple place, but it's ancient. It's about burial mounds and pieces of water and landscape and clumps of trees and places where you don't necessarily know where the bodies are buried. Um, and there's this sort of ancient, uh, this quite uh, um, unexpected reciprocity between ancientness and modernness. Um, and so I was, especially in some of those images that we ended with, the abstraction, that you use that word abstraction to refer also to the farm buildings, Tony, but the abstraction of that really quite like rude relationship to nature where the window is literally a picture window with the strict modernity of what's in the foreground and then the timelessness, if you like, of the um, of, of nature, which of course is made by us, as you said, made over many years. So there's a very simple relationship and yet in that relationship, um, quite a kind of curated temporality. So that's a roundabout sort of critique, if you like, but I, I, my question was really, do you have, do you think that the relationship to, to time and to memory that these buildings um, uh, produce and sort of cultivate through all three buildings, do you think it's, I mean, it feels to me intentional, it's definitely not incidental, but I guess my question is, is it something that you're trying to do about the relationship to the past? Yeah, that's kind of, I can stop there. It doesn't work that way as a designer. You, you you don't. Well, this designer doesn't think that way. I mean, I I have to confess I have a huge problem reading books. You know, I, I and um, not that I dismiss formalized knowledge, but but after a long period of time, I've realised that my skills and intelligence lie in in the world of objects and. Um, Architectures, when we talk about ambiguity, um, well, actually, I wrote an article in a first drift for um, Adrian Forty called Response to Words and Buildings, where I talked about the difference between the way that um, uh, architectural critics think, you know, because their arguments have to be sustainable in, in arg argumentation, in lectures. And but architects are much free, are much more. Uh, careless in a way with um, facts and ideas because what we do what what we do as designers we jam together things that don't want to be put together and we make them work and um it's an art of the plausible but if you're any good the objects you make will have resonances for other people and people will see other meanings in than the ones you you want and that's what I, I do want, but I, I don't want to determine what people think. But I, I can't think in the terms, with respect, I can't think in the terms that you're describing. It's just not how I work. You know, I, there's a statement about Leverens that he could sit for an hour looking at a nail and thinking things he could do with it. And, you know, I, I look at parts of cities when I go through them and I think what I could do with them. So. As a designer, you're dealing with um, material culture and what other people think of what you do is what other people think of what you do. And I'm, it, I'm not as crude as um, the abstract expressionist who said that art history is to artists as ornithology is to birds. I mean, that's that's just rude, you know. I mean, I acknowledge that writers and interpreters of of architecture are supremely important but i just can't work that way you know my skill is in making things and making things that uh, seem to have potency for other people thanks um kirsten uh over to you please for a question thank you i'm trying out my ear pods can you hear me we can see your earpods. Ah, they great. Um, <laughs> I want to ask a uh, probably a less formal academic question straight to sketching um, and about the sighting. How many sketches for the position of that building were there? Because I think if I had to get my sketch roll out and my, my pen, I'd, there'd be a few overlays, quite a few overlays. One would be at 90 degrees, that building turned 90 with some water, connecting 
to nature and then long views, but also a, I know you mentioned the open courtyard, you opened the courtyard out purposefully. And if you closed the courtyard and then gave prominence to the historic building at the end, yeah, yeah, the question about the sighting, how many sketches and overlays? <laughs> not, not many, actually. I okay. mean, oh. we, um, Torb and Sean Hire and I stood on the site and I said it should go there. It was very clear. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, how can I say this? I, in certain parts of a project, I'm I'm very clear for some reason. I just have an ability to go straight to a certain proposition. I mean, others I have to search, but I don't like to. You know, Picasso said he didn't look for things; he found things. You know, that the important thing is to find things and to to find um, approaches that have got some. Um, possibility of success. So no, I, I, that's not how I, I work with respect. I, I, do, I do draw sketches, but mainly about the, the detail of the building, how um, things like doors and entrances and windows might affect people, how they scale, their scale might make people feel. And but that's, that's when I do produce lots of sketches. But um, in the beginning, you just said it will go there, but then the real the real problem was um, the facade making and the scale of it and what it should look like. That was the real issue because it was a completely different building from any other building on in the locale. Uh, so it couldn't be anything other than an art gallery. But how could it talk to the surroundings? How could it be familial? You know, and yeah, it's in contrast entirely. Obviously, white, not natural brick. Not green. Obviously, we don't want. Well, I've actually done a green building, but um, you know, it's 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 contrasting. Well, it it is and it isn't because it it's the same color as the white barn, you know. So it, it yeah. does. It did. I consciously didn't want to make a building that was that was different. It had to have some appearance that was already in the visual scene. Yeah. I think by virtue of the fact that it's white, it just offers you a, a level of drama when you get yeah. the skies that you do and the and the, that particular light that you know sort of reflects off those greens, the yellowy greens of the grass and mm. grey clouds rolling in. You're always going to get a level of drama there. Hey? Well, you do need that. I mean, if if the building had been left in the brickwork in which it was made, which was similar to the the yellow brick of the building next door. Mm. I think that would have been a failure. I think the, the point yes. I agree with what you're saying that it, it it needs to do. As I said earlier, you you put things together that shouldn't go together as design, and you hold them together. So yeah. on the one hand, the building should, in my estimation, should uh, be familial. On the other, it should be itself. You know. Yeah. So what, familiar in terms of scale, and then yeah. offer. Uh, a, a presence in terms of contrast. I, I agree. I, I I love that it's white. <laughs> for what that's worth. Scale and more humble. But <laughs> like all good families, it should have. Uh, it could allow itself to be the member of the family that went furthest and thought more and um, had more style. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Um, Christian, please. Hi, no, hi Tony. Uh, feeling terribly well, so no, no, it's fine. Thank, thanks anyway. Yeah, it's, hi Tony, I enjoyed it. Um, we'd like to hear a little bit more about the materials because you said you worked a lot on the details. So maybe you could talk a little bit about maybe the different materials you used for the th for the three of them. But but I had a, a sort of a, a a question before really, which was about um, you talked about uh, the sort of the way in which you make space, and I'm very interested to sort of understand whether there's any moments in your career where you've the inside spaces don't match the outside form or the predicted space. I mean, like, for example, in in Asperin's Woodland Chapel, that amazing moment when you go under mm -hmm. the uh, canopy and you find yourself in a very surprising space, which is not what the roof suggests it's going to be. And I'm very aware in all of your schemes that there, that there was a uh, a, a, a very 
clear relationship between the inside and the outside even even in the the danish one where obviously the very strange um twisted if you like formal roof lights do something with the external form of the building and then do something practical inside in terms of the light still there is a sort of sense of of matching which is not always the case in galleries so that relationship between inside and outside were there any moments when you thought of shifting from one to the other and creating more of a sort of difference between the two i i, I can't do what aspen does and i have to admit that um well i like the Woodlands Chapel, I find it horribly effete as well at the same time. You know, it's sort of, um, it's, the Aspen could be um, wonderful and completely consoling, or he could be um, sort of painfully, um, painfully fancy pants. And the, the, the library has that in spades, you know, some of it you look at with absolute wonder, like the, the, the drum space and then some of it you think, oh, please. So I, I, I do instinctively look for some kind of consistency between inside and outside. But vis-a-vis -vis materials, the the, the um, Holy Isle building was, I neglected to say, was to be made of wood, an untreated wood, and on a wooden frame, which would have been easy to carry up the hill because you couldn't get motorized, well, you probably get a four wheel drive to to bring uh, stuff to the site from the water edge. Um, but in short lengths, you know, and um, nailed together with something like a Western red cedar cladding that would color down and would be less conspicuous. Um, the Faith House, the same thing. It's a <clears throat> very early, um, timber frame building with um, uh, a newsprint as its insulant, which the local builder hated and didn't want to do it, and eventually did do it. And with red cedar, at that time, I was looking at how you could make buildings that were extremely low maintenance for um, clients who didn't have very much money, you know, so they wouldn't have to constantly repaint them and that the building would Look all right in years to come. I mean, wood wood cladding is very strange because if the sun gets on it, it gets tanned, you know. And if the rain gets on it, it goes black, and you you can't really predict it. When we we made um, a wooden building for the outside the Tower of London, which is very funny, and um, eventually we persuaded. Um, the Tower of London people to um, have it painted white with a, a white stain and then they would have to repaint it <clears throat> because it would look really <clears throat> dismal. I mean, you have to think um, whether a building's um, becoming more and more weathered um, is is welcoming, you know, or is it not? Does it look like a failure? And these, you know, one thing that's a Success in one in one condition, one situation, is a failure in another, and that's what you have to think of as an architect in terms of materials. The museum's built in brick. It's built in brick. Well, it's not built in brick. Actually, it's interesting. The structure is um, precast concrete. We originally wanted to do it as a steel frame, on the basis that you could take the whole insides out in um, twenty years' time. If you didn't want what we'd done, which is what a lot of galleries do, you know, they their desires for appearance and light change, and so we said, okay, let's make something that that you know where our architecture could just be destroyed, the interior architecture. But <clears throat> but in Denmark, you don't do that. You use precast concrete slab construction. That's the modus, and it's to do with um, the 60s um, introduction of that as a way of building lots of buildings very quickly, but also it keeps some um, costs down. Co you know, costs of labour are very expensive in Denmark because of the social costs. So you, so we built a building which had um, maybe four groups of rooms in it. The the, the enfilade rooms could all be taken out, 
um, so you could have you could turn it into a long long gallery. Um, um, so you, sometimes you're surprised when you're working in in a country that's not your own. You often what what you would naturally do in your own country you can't do, and you have to you have to move very quickly. I mean that's working in Holland. We we found that we found that there were uh, let's say materializations that the Burning trade in Holland could do that were miraculous to us. You know, lots of precast terrazzo staircases and things like that, which you struggle to get here. So each culture is different in what it lets you do. The brick, the brick bonding, is slightly strange, isn't it, at the gallery as well? Excuse me. The brick, the brick bonding is not. It's not like something that will happen in the UK either, is it? I seem to remember. Uh, it's stretcher bond in in weak mortar, so we didn't have to have any expansion joints in the facade. But but it's very common in Denmark to use brick as a as an external cladding. You know that's very very established. And in a way, what what I the love affair I had has been with um, Danish modernism of the, of the 60s, which used brick, painted brick. Um, and there was this interesting in Denmark. There's a culture of people who are a little bit younger than me that, that think what we're doing is all right. And then there are people like Bjarke Engels who won't let me access his website and things like that. So uh, it's interesting how you, when you work in foreign cultures, what um, uh, what dust arises when you stamp on the ground, you know. Thanks. Any more? Dagmar, do you want to ask a question? You don't have to. You're on You're mute, Dagmar. There you go. Well, actually, I, I did have some, uh, I made a little note of some, a comment you made very early on in your talk about the retreat center. Um, you mentioned that you wanted it to be built by local builders um, and be non-architectural in character. Yeah. And and you showed that picture of the temple uh, where you had gone to a service, which was kind of non-architectural. When I look at these little windows on, on teams here, uh, most of the participants are in rooms which are very architectural in character. There is a kind of homogeneity to it, you know, white walls and well, a certain type of art and certain type of lighting and so on. And I wondered whether you really did mean that you would be happy with those retreat rooms being non-architectural in, in their character. How did you envision that? Uh, well, in fact, the, the very formal buildings that I showed were built by volunteers. They weren't built by local builders, as I understand it. And that, I think, is part of the ethos of um, Sammy Ling, that the monks build it, you know, they get on with it. And so seemed to me plausible that the, the retreat centers would be built by by unskilled people. So you have a very, very simple construction system of framed wood with cladding and the cladding would go horizontal and the building would be at an angle. So it would be, or maybe it wouldn't be, you know, maybe, maybe if I'd come to site, it would have all been different, but, but I thought that the, what did I think? I thought it would be a contrast to the formality of the buildings in in central Scotland. It would be um, it'd be unexpected. A lot, a lot of Leverins. I'm working on a lecture on Leverins, which is scaring me to death because I don't know enough to talk about Leverins. But and um, but one thing that I particularly like about Leverins is his susceptibility to vernacular building, you know, and I've always liked vernacular building. And I've, I've liked the fact that a window <clears throat> was, let's say, originated a thousand years ago and with animal skin over it, you know, and then glass was invented in small panes and, and then double glazing was invented and then very large double glazing was invented and then uh, a window with a wooden frame inside, aluminium on the outside, was invented. 
but it's still a window, you know. So I'm delighted by the cultural history of of uh, uh, things that buildings are built from. When I, I've worked between high school and going to architecture school, I worked as a as a, a hod carrier, a bricklayer's labourer, and um, what I liked most about the site was not the the built buildings. We built buildings that were awful, you know. So, but it was the the piles of bricks and holes in the ground had this um, quality that appealed to me, and it's always been there's been a particular appeal about materials for me. I mean, you don't you shape things when you put them together, as I've described. You shape them. You give them a certain type of manner, you know, which another architect would do something completely different. And so my feeling for materials is um, they're alive, you know, they're, they're alive. And um, well, we did it, we did a little building in the country, an art gallery in the countryside called Artsway, which sadly is closed. And we built a store cupboard. Now, having worked with artists, um, you you discover that you have to make every space in the building somewhere that an artist could exhibit because <coughs> the first show of the Listen Gallery was um, a Dan Graham show and we'd made um, a store under a staircase and these we'd also made perfectly lovely galleries and Dan said I want to exhibit under the stair you know so so do it so we we made the store store with big doors that somebody could exhibit in but the doors um doors were made later you know and then when they were put on the building had been tanned you know the sun had tanned it wood wood gets a tan you know and the doors were conspicuously but it's 30 years now i think it's settled in i think it's kind of achieved what we originally thought does that answer question yes yes so I, I was i suppose i was thinking that for a retreat for a place for meditation that the physicality of the room could become somehow the subject of a certain kind of meditative practice um, yeah no that's important. I, often I, there's a sort of an austere aesthetic to it and i um, i would have needed to talk to the the teachers of Sammy and Ling about that because they have very strict ideas. Well, they have a lot of knowledge about what a retreat space should be. And I've been on retreats, so I know something about that. And um, but that that's I wouldn't make that decision. I'd I'd take advice from them, you know. And you can see that the people in Sammy Ling were very strict. I mean, those Zen Buddhism, which I studied and Tibetan Buddhism, they, there's not much space for argument, you know, and then you hit with a stick, you know, but you have to ask, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, you know, you, it's not something you do, um, most people do, and you have to accept that it, there's a purpose to the end of it, you know, and, um, so, um, I mean, the rooms would probably be quite dark, you know, the, the, so, that's unfathomable now at this distance, but we really thought we were going to win that, but it was run by um, somebody who'd worked at Richard Rogers. So even even the Buddhists can have strange directions, you know. So uh, didn't win that one. Yeah. Um, Nick, did you have a further question? I thought you had a hand up, but please. Yeah, I was just, I was just uh, interested. This one. Sorry. See if I can bat this one away. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm being, no, kind of, I'm just. I mean, different. You know. I mean, going going back to the question about culture of building, um, and you you're obviously referring to kind of practices that are both as much economic as well as having some kind of cultural. Um, is something implicitly cultural in terms of what they 
uh, how they contribute to to human life and the, da the daily life of societies. Looking at you know practices in Denmark, which are different from Holland, which is which is different from the UK. And I guess when we think of I don't know vernacular, of course, we have much older traditions and practices that go back centuries, which somehow persist in different ways. And I'm kind of I'm interested in this question of the cultural nature of building practice versus you know. Um, Guarini's idea of that na that culture begins in our indwelling in nature. So the idea that in our age, you know, we we presume that culture or cultural practice and nature are kind of at the opposite spectrums. They are that they are, you know, um, that there's a simple polarity between nature and culture. That's always seems to be presented by ecologists, environmentalists, and philosophers. So we're we're looking at something rather different. We talk about culture beginning in our indwelling in nature. And it seems that's interesting for me is that when I look at your drawings, I think that something going on in your drawings, which is anything but a view, it's almost as if it is about this idea of indwelling actually in a drawing. The drawing transcends this idea of the, the idea of a kind of straightforward perspectivization of space to something that deals with, you know, the terrain, the ground. You start with the ground and how that becomes the basis and the sky this notion of horizon as the framework broadly as the as the context within which the building gradually emerges in fragments and i'm i'm intrigued by how you see your drawing or the design process i guess as as a as a form of indwelling in nature or is there something about the creative process that kind of begins from something much more fundamental you know it doesn't presume construction methods it doesn't even presume a kind of given site but actually presumes a, a series of relationships which actually are themselves implicit maybe in both nature and in culture what happens of course on a building site is a different story but just seems to be something interesting about your drawing uh when i hear the word culture i reach for my imagination sorry it's a cheap shot but you know there you are um I, I uh, what do I think? Um, I see. I think nature does exist in a, in a, a way that we can't apprehend, and it's good that it does. There's um, a moment in the Quinta de Conciasao Garden by Tavra where uh, the trees, which weren't natural, I mean, they were planted by a monastic community, but to my eye, at least, um, those Portuguese architects from that period um, were able to make buildings which were had powerful connections to the surroundings, not only the the um, natural surroundings, but but in the that garden, the the tennis pavilion looks out to a, a dockyard. Mm. <laughs> it's like. In in Portugal, if there's, there's a beauty spot. Somebody who put a shoe factory in it, you know. It's um, but the point I was going to make was that at a certain point, just um, in that garden, it, and it maybe just my imagination, but um, the trees are just something that you can't comprehend as a human being. You can't you can't imagine what it's like to be a tree. You can't imagine what in a processes what anything that might resemble consciousness might exist what they thought and Sharon is if they've got one um, and that's the aspect of nature that does give me hope you know I mean we, we're in a capitalist society that is destroying is destroying us by consumption destroying everything by consumption. And we're having to argue uh, that we shouldn't do that. And we're arguing unsuccessfully. COP27 will not achieve anything. And we will see an ecological disaster, I think, because um, in the capitalist system, uh, respect for nature is seen as futile. It's pathetic, you know, it's seen as pathetic. It isn't. It's it's cruel, you know, and it's so it's that aspect of nature that that 
gives me hope. You know, that it would never reveal itself. It would just be. And the best, most beautiful things exist in that way. You know that they. They just are. You look at the sea, and it is. You can know the tides, and you can know the way that the moon affects it, but as a thing in itself, it, you know, as, as a sentient being looking at it, you'll never know what, what it is, you know, what you, you'll never be able to frame it in your own terms. What do you do? I mean, poets frame it, they frame it in human terms, don't they? But it's that aspect of nature that gives me hope. And in a way, to be overwhelmed by nature will be horribly unpleasant and deadly, but in a way not wrong. You know, one might end up returning to Earth and being anonymous and useful um, to be philosophical about this. But I, I don't, but I, I'm really, really, really uh, anti-capitalist right now. And I think we, we need to have a political change that's great. And I don't know if we're going to get it. So nature will do what nature does, you know, it will readjust itself in terms, in relation to what we've done to it. And it won't respect us. It won't take account of us. It will be destructive and we have to accept that. Any other cheery questions that I can... No, thank you. No, but I think I think just to just to um, draw us to a conclusion, actually, uh, it's just uh, brilliant to see all those decades of um, sediment of architectural thinking being distilled in such beautiful projects. And I think, uh, you know, I, I would just say um, in the kind of stormy world we're in, uh, tonight was an absolute delight. And thank you so much for sparing your time to share your thoughts with us. And the dialogue was wonderful, Tony. So wishing you well and, um, and look forward to the next occasion when we can actually see each other. I think Christian's uh, just raised something, but I, I, I'm kind of drawing things to a conclusion right now, I think. Um, uh, so on that, on, that, on that apocalyptic but brilliant note, thank you hugely.